I filmed this episode a while back when I was sporting a beard, but even without a beard, it's a good one. Because I get to talk to Dr. Terry Walls, who is a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa. She teaches internal medicine residents in their primary care clinics. And she also conducts clinical research and has published over 60 peer-reviewed scientific abstracts, posters, and papers. Now, apart from being a doctor, what she's most well-known for is reversing her symptoms of MS, which is a chronic autoimmune disease. Her self-experimentation has led her to creating the WALLS protocol, and now she helps people from all over the world manage their autoimmune diseases in a natural, and this is the important part, proven protocol. Now, we'll talk more about her research and why the scientific process is so important during the interview. This episode is brought to you by Regency for Expats, one of the most innovative health insurance providers out there. They aim to help people like me who are globally mobile and looking to cover their health as they live and work around the world. Now, I particularly like Regency because not only do they fully support you when you're in an emergency, but they're also looking to change the insurance industry by being proactive with the care they provide. Now, they offer counseling services, nutritional coaching, and fitness consultations as part of their regular insurance packages. Now, does your insurance do that? Go to regencyforexpats.com to find out more. Dr. Walls, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here today, and we're going to talk about so many interesting things. Um, so can I call you Terry? Oh, absolutely. Okay, Terry. What I would like to do to start with is to um, have you talk about your personal story to put it into context, what the WALLS protocol is, how you developed it, and, and who you're helping. So could we start at the beginning? Would that be okay? Well, sure. Uh, and I'm going to take your listeners back uh, 20 years. Okay. I'm out walking with my wife. My left leg is dragging. Um, I see the neurologist a couple of days later who says, Terry, this could be bad or really, really bad. So at night, uh, while I'm going through the workout for the next couple of weeks, I'm thinking I would rather have a fatal diagnosis than a disabling one. So uh, actually I'm praying for ALS. Right. Um, two weeks later, I hear MS. Uh, and, you know, I see the best people take the newest drugs. Still within three years, I hear tilt, recline, wheelchair. Now, I also have trigeminal neuralgia as part of my problem. In those face pains, those electrical zingers have been getting relentlessly worse. Um, you know, they turn on uh, a light breeze, talking, swallowing, triggers the pain. Uh, my 10-year-old daughter hugs me, causing more pain. Um, but, you know, fortunately I'm a physician. I go back to reading the basic science and I begin experimenting on myself uh, based on what I'm reading. Um, I, I add supplements, I develop theories that mitochondria are really key. It slows my decline. Then I discover a study using electrical stimulation of muscles, um, I asked my physical therapist, can I try that? My test session hurts bad, really bad. But when it's over, I feel great. And so we add electrical stimulation to my uh, physical therapy routines. And then I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. I take their course on neuroprotection. I have more supplements. And I have this um, big aha. I was, you know, like, what if I redesign my paleo diet that I'd been following already for five years, I, based on the science I've been reading, the list of uh, supplements I've been taking. Uh, and so I, I, I do that. And um, it's stunning. I'm getting stronger. Wow. My pain is gone. My brain fog is gone. And my physical therapist says, you know, Terry, uh, let's have you lifting weights. And then I begin walking first with a cane, then without a cane. Uh, and, um, and now mind you, my physicians have told me with secondary progressive MS recovery is not possible. Uh, and so I, I've done all that and not to get better, just to slow my decline. So, at, you know, as this transformation is happening, I don't know what it means because I'm still in the take one day at a time. Uh, but on, on Mother's Day, and this is back in 2008, um, I, I had been talking to Jack that I, we used to bike a lot and I wanted to bike again. And she said, you know, maybe in the fall, things keep going well. But, you know, the Mother's Day, I, I decide I want to try biking. We had this emergency family meeting. 
And we decide that, yes, I can try. So I, I'm poised uh, at the end of the road. Uh, uh, Jack's going to bike behind me. Zach's going to jog along on the left. Seb's going to jog along on the right. You know, and I push off. The, the bike wobbles a little bit, but I catch my balance and I bike around the block. Uh, and my son is crying. My daughter's crying. My wife's crying. I'm crying. Uh, because that's the moment where I, I really understood viscerally that it's not, who knew, who knows how much recovery might be possible in that the current understanding of multiple sclerosis is incomplete. The current understanding of secondary progressive multiple sclerosis is incomplete. Uh, and, you know, it also changes the way I think about disease and health. It changes the way I practice medicine. It will change the focus of my research. Uh, and in just uh, four months, uh, five months later, I'm able to do an 18.5 mile bike ride with my family. And you know, once again, we're all crying. You know, my kids are crying, my wife's crying, I'm crying. And uh, that really changes the direction of my life because as I said, you know, in my clinics, I, I, I now start talking about diet uh, and exercise uh, and I'm transforming the lives of my patients. And I began, you know, my little talks at the organic grocery store. Uh, and, you know, we have more and more people coming to hear me. I get more invitations talking uh, to larger and larger groups. That leads ultimately to the TED Talk. That leads ultimately to the book deal. That leads the MS Society to contact me and say, you know, we're having a wellness uh, uh, research uh, committee. We want you to come. Uh, and... It changes everything. Wow. It changes everything in my life. Now, so that time period, was that over 10 years from the diagnosis to riding, uh, riding your bike? Okay, so I'm diagnosed in 2000. In retrospect, my symptoms began in 1980. Uh, in 2003, I'm in a tilt recline wheelchair. In 2007, I cannot sit up. I'm having progressively severe trigeminal neuralgia that's very difficult to turn off. And it, you know, it's clear to me, Ed, that my future is bedridden, demented, probably intractable, continuous pain. electrical pain from the trigeminal neuralgia, at which point I will not swallow anymore because swallowing mm -hmm. triggers the pain to be even worse. And the agreement I had with my wife and I changed my directive was there will be no feeding tube. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it actually took great comfort in, in making that change um, because there would be a way out of pain. Wow. So that was your mindset back then. That was my mindset. Like, okay, I, yeah. I, 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 my experience was this is a relentless disease. My physician said, this is a relentless disease. We're treating you the best we can, Terry. But yes, it's a progressive disease. Um, recovery does not happen with secondary progressive MS. So I'm reading and doing all I can to slow. There, I have no understanding that, it, that recovery would be possible. And, you know, it's remarkable. As I was recovering, you know, and, and I'm walking around now without a cane. I'm yeah. walking around the neighborhood, uh, uh, around the block. As, as, as part of as having a progressive neurodegenerative disease, one of the, one of the adaptation strategies was, you finally get to a point where you can just take each day as it unfolds, no meaning beyond, I, I have another day uh, with my family. Wow. And so you know, I'm having this remarkable improvement. Uh, and it wasn't until I had that bike ride, like, okay, how much improvement might be possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and that's actually, uh, it was a, 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 shortly after that that I called uh, the local organic grocer and said, you know, could I come give you a little talk about my experience with food? Uh, and they said, well, you know, we, you know, we do cooking demos, but you know, it sounds sort of interesting. We'll do it. And, and um, so they advertised and they kept having to change the location because they had more and more people that wanted to sign up. Uh, and so their classes were usually 
uh, to a size of 20. Uh, and now this was to a, a class the size of about 80. Uh, and then, of course, more and more organizations are hearing about my story, they want me to come speak. And I'm speaking to local churches, community colleges, regional events, and, you know, and then that TED Talk. And that TED Talk, of course, in my book, changes everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you know, along the way, um, uh, early on, I got banned by the MS Society. Because That's I what I wanted to ask household. you about. Yeah. You, 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 it wasn't that you rubbed anyone up the wrong way. It's just that you were doing things differently. Is that right? Well, you know, um, so I got banned. Uh, and then at the same time, my uh, primary care colleagues and my traumatic brain injury colleagues were complaining to the chief of staff that I was not practicing the standard of care, that I was using diet to treat traumatic brain injury and, uh, you know, a lot of chronic diseases and, you know, and step the standard of care. So my chief of staff calls me to say, Terry, what's going on? And I'm getting all these complaints. And unfortunately, I, I had anticipated this problem. So I had an armful of scientific papers that I brought with me. I went uh, through them, a, a few, and then John's okay, okay, Terry, uh, enough. But you can't talk about it the way you are because this is not the standard of care. Uh, and so my response was, well, if I can't do the latest research, I, and I'm happy to follow that direction, as soon as it's universal, you get an email out to all the faculty, of course I'll follow that. And then I smiled and I waited. There's sort of this long pregnant pause. He goes, okay, well, we st you still can't do what you were doing because it's upsetting people. Hang so it, what we have to do is- Your clients or your colleagues? As my, my colleagues. Just your colleagues, no complaints Just, from patients. No, 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 I, I, you know, the patients were loving what I was doing. I had all of these great comments in, um, uh, from patients. My colleagues were uncomfortable. And then John said, and actually, I'm, I'm immensely grateful. Uh, I, I think John was very wise. He said, you need to go meet uh, with the person who runs the complementary and alternative medicine clinic at the university. So you know how to talk about this in public and how to talk about it in your medical record. Because if you get an anonymous complaint from one of your disgruntled colleagues, we'll have to do an audit. Right. If it, the Board of Medicine gets a complaint, they'll have to do an audit of your medical records. And if the people auditing you don't believe in the basic science that you're talking about, you'll lose your license. So my eyes go, well, that's a problem. Yeah. So then I go meet with uh, Dr. Nisley um, and you know, she, she teaches me. And, and I think it's very wise that what I'm doing is improving health improving cell physiology, and then monitoring the patients um, so they don't become over-medicated uh, with low blood pressure, low blood sugars, uh, sedated because they no longer need their pain meds, uh, manic because they no longer need their uh, psychotropic meds. Uh, and so I, I then changed my uh, messaging in the public. I always was very careful to say, you know, work with your primary care doc, uh, as you implement these things, improve how your cells function, you will probably need adjustments to your medication and your treatment plans. Uh, and we're creating health. I am not treating disease. I am creating health. I am creating healthier cells. And as a result, there may come a time when you need fewer meds and smaller doses. Uh, and so I put that in my record. I, I was always very careful to say that publicly. And now my partners are like, that's a message they're very comfortable with. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in fact, I, you know, I'm really grateful the MS Society banned me and my partners complained. So I, I got instruction early on uh, and I never had to go through the ordeal of a peer review audit that, that could have been traumatizing. Oh, interesting. So, um, so it all worked out, you know, and, and I'm immensely grateful. Uh, John, in the end, became a huge fan, a huge supporter. That's great. So with 
So you were doing this research basically on your own. You had your yeah. your your standard physician doing the standard of care, the normal the normal protocols. You were doing this research by yourself, and then did you find you had to taper yourself off some of the drugs that you were being given? Oh yeah, absolutely. So uh, I I have this transformation. I've been on provigil uh, because I have severe fatigue uh, with MS, uh, and and yeah, I don't, that was probably three months into this. You know, my fatigue is gone. My mental clarity is gone. My trigeminal neuralgia is gone. I'm clearly getting stronger. And I can't sleep. Mm. I just cannot sleep. Uh, and then my wife, Jackie, says, I think you should stop that provigil. You're not sleeping anymore. Stop your provigil. Right. I go, oh, yeah, of course. That so I staffed my provigil, and then I could go back to sleeping again. Uh, and uh, then I thought, you know, I bet I don't need as much Neuranta, uh, the medication uh, uh, that I was taking to help keep the um, trigeminal neuralgia under control. So I, I tried tapering that off. Uh, my face pain came back. Uh, and over the years, what I realized is, I can take a tiny dose of Neurontin and do well. Okay. If I go entirely off, I, I seem to be more at risk to have that pain come back on. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's 10 years since I've done all this, well, 13. And I've been tempted intermittently to try going off again because, you know, my most recent MRI, uh, the uh, lesions in my cervical cord are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So uh, you know, my neurologist says, do you want to try going off the Neurontin? Uh, so we had that debate. Uh, I'm on a small dose. Um, it, it, and part of the problem is you know, if I get a virus, uh, my face pain will turn on. Right. If I'm accidentally exposed to some gluten, dairy, or eggs, because I've eaten somewhere else or in a restaurant, my face pain will turn on. If I take too many flights, Interesting. If I don't, if I'm not doing enough uh, self care, my face pain will turn on. Right. So, and yeah. it, it's so horrific. Yeah. You know, I'm like, you know, a little dose of Neurontin. Yeah. No face pain. And, you know, I'll probably it, it, it's it's pretty hard to think that I'll try it completely off again. I remember you saying that your face pain uh, is actually a gift. And when you said you said this at one of the conferences you were in, because it, it gives you a clue that whatever you're doing at that time is not good for you. And a lot of people don't have that feedback, that canary in the coal mine. So they, they end up doing the things that got them into the situation in the first place. You know, the, the people and I, um, when I'm dealing with my MS patients, I help them reframe their, their current symptoms as their biosensor that lets them know the microglia in their brain are either very protective healing or very inflammatory neurotoxic. And so if you have a sensory disturbance or a visual disturbance, or if you happen to have a skin disturbance, so you can see it, then it's, you can get a, a more rapid feedback as to how happy your microglia are right. and how inflamed your body is. If you have anxiety or depression, that's a little more subtle. And often with mental health, self-awareness uh, is diminished. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those folks have a harder time responding to their environment. Helping people with pain develop a, a different relationship to their pain, realizing the pain is a signal, it's a gift, and you could use that to learn what the triggers are in your environment and how good is your self-care? Okay. And over time, you can keep doing a better job of your self-care and a better job of identifying the triggers. All right. Well, I want to get into self-care uh, a little bit later, but from this research, from the self-experimentation, you developed the WALS protocol, the, and you're known for the nutritional aspect of that. Can you give us a, a high-level overview of, of what that involves? 
So uh, we're taking out what are the three most inflammatory food groups, uh, gluten, uh, which is in many ancient grains, uh, dairy proteins, casein, because it's very similar in amino acid sequence to gluten, and then eggs are the third most common. Uh, and I replace them with these radical things known as vegetables, particularly the non-starchy ones. I want people to have lots of green leafy vegetables, vegetables in the uh, cabbage family, onion family, mushroom family, in deeply pigmented colorful vegetables. Uh, and then I have strategies to have sufficient protein for meat eaters and for the vegetarian and vegans. And we talk about having sufficient uh, fat uh, so that you have enough fat to make the uh, fat wrappers or cell membranes around your cells and to make the myelin, which is the insulation on the wiring between cells. Okay. And so with this increase in, you know, this remarkable food group called vegetables, do, do some people struggle? And, and the reason I ask this is there's, there's a message coming out of the, um, the, you know, the carnivore type diet that says the vegetables oh, sure. are trying to kill you. They say that they've got the, the phytochemicals on them that can cause yeah. problems. Well, um, so plants do make compounds that are trying to kill the insects and the things that eat them. The, uh, that is true. Mm -hmm. However, those compounds, we have adapted to those compounds and those compounds speak to our genes, speak to my uh, uh, DNA, turning genes on, turning genes off and help my cells run more effectively and more efficiently. So you wanna have plants a wide diversity of plants for greater health. Uh, there are, the carnivore folks will say there are a few societies that are, eat almost exclusively meat uh, mm -hmm. and thrive. Uh, and so I, I, I hesitate to say this is a uniformly toxic diet, uh, but I also wanna invite my carnivore friends because uh, I've had this conversation with them many, many times is, if you want to change the practice of medicine, if you want the carnivore diet to be understood and utilized in clinical care, we need first case reports of disease states that have been improved uh, by the carnivore diet. Then we need case series uh, of these uh, patients whose health status have been improved by the carnivore diet. Then we need small pilot clinical trials. And if you want those written up and you provide us the data, I have medical students who would write up those case reports, who would write up those case series, but you have to share the data with us. Right. Uh, so far, they've not taken me up on that offer. And I've said, you know what, if you want to do, want to do a small pilot study, single arm study of the carnivore diet, uh, and you give us, you know, tell me the budget you'd like me to, to work with, I'll write up a proposal for you. And we would conduct the pilot study to do that. Yeah, and you know, my team, we, we do a, a wide variety of diets that we investigate with our dietary research. So far, none of the carnivore people have taken me up on the offer to write up a case report, a case series, or to do pilot studies. And until they do that, you and I don't know how to utilize the carnivore diet safely. Right. And, and that's what you were told originally, wasn't it? The same sort of thing. If you want to. Yeah, I, I, I was told the same thing. Was, yeah. Okay, Terry, here's the pathway. First, you have to write up a case report. And I said, like, on myself? And they said, yep. Yeah. I said, okay. Then, so I did that. So, okay, now you have to do case series. Oh, okay. I did that. Then it was, now you have to do a single pilot study. And that meant I had to raise about $100,000. But. And how did you raise that? Like, where did that come from? Uh, it came from the Canadians, the Ashton <laughs> Embry group. Um, so uh, a you know, big call out to Ashton Embry. Uh, they got me 50,000. And then I got another 50,000 from uh, the electrical therapy device maker uh, and the devices. So that, and we got a PhD student to help me run the experiment. And we got undergraduates to help run the experiment. And so we're able to do that first study. Then Ashton Embry's group uh, gave me funding for a couple more small pilot studies. Uh, and then it was the public 
enthusiasm for what I was doing that got the MS Society to make dietary research a priority. And I had, uh, I was aware that their constituents really wanted a head to head comparison of Swank and Wall's diets. Right. And so I wrote the proposal and they funded it. Uh, and so now it's the largest uh, dietary study that's been conducted uh, and published uh, that's randomized. And was, was there a difference between the, the two outcomes well, of the two diets? Or? So, uh, yeah, so let's talk about that. Uh, what we did was we brought people in, did uh, all of our assessments, and then said, eat your usual diet for the next 12 weeks. And then we, we brought them back, repeated the assessments, so we know how stable fatigue, quality of life, and the clinical outcomes are. And they were yeah. stable. Then they got randomized to Swank or to Walls. And we followed them for 12 weeks. They got five calls from the dietitians. Then we um, repeated all the assessments. Then we followed them another 12 weeks without uh, uh, support. So the, the intervention lasted 24 weeks. All right. The primary question was, was could Walls have a, a greater reduction in fatigue, uh, measuring fatigue severity scale score. Then we had uh, a, another more sensitive fatigue score, quality of life scores, uh, uh, mood scores, and some hand and walking function. What we were able to show is at 12 weeks, Walls and Swank had a relatively equivalent reduction in fatigue. Uh, and that surprised us. What was, uh, Interesting was the Walls group had significantly greater improvement in quality of life uh, than Swank. Uh, and then at 24 weeks, they had greater improve, uh, continued greater improvement in quality of life uh, and a greater reduction in fatigue severity as measured by the modified fatigue impact scale. Uh, both groups had uh, not much change uh, in the hand function but probably not surprising. No, we're not uh, training it. We weren't training that. Yeah. Uh, both groups had not much change in walking endurance, and we weren't training that. Uh, plus, we'd said, don't add a new exercise program because we're studying diet. Yeah. Unless your physical, unless your physician directs you to physical therapy or something, then by all means, go, go do that. But at 24 weeks, the Walls group had clinically meaningful improvement in their walking endurance. It, uh, it was more so than the Swank group. Um, the Swank group improved just a little bit, but didn't hit clinical significance. Uh, and it was statistically significant, that improvement in endurance. The difference between Walls and Swank had a p-value of 0.08, so it's not statistically significant. But nonetheless, it was still interesting. What, what's the difference between the diets? Is that an easy, oh, an easy sure. question? Yeah, so um, Swank really focused on saturated fat. Uh, he, you know, he developed his theories right after World War II and felt like the lower fat diet uh, it, uh, was important to cardiovascular disease uh, in that during World War II, there was less uh, MS and the MS was less severe. And he said, because people couldn't get eggs, couldn't get meat, couldn't get butter, so there's less right. saturated fat. The other thing they couldn't get was sugar. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I should keep, keep that in mind. Uh, so we focused on reducing the fat. Um, now the Swank organization uh, foundation, uh, because uh, Swank is, has uh, since died, they had been influenced by my work. So they had said, by the way, you should also be eating vegetables and eating more whole grain. So we modified the Swank diet to make it actually a little bit better. Um, we said, four servings of grain, preferably whole grain, and please have four servings of vegetables. Uh, so, uh, and both groups got cod liver oil, vitamin D, and a multivitamin. Mm -hmm. I, I think Swank uh, reduced the sugar, uh, reduced the trans fats. Um, uh, so that was helpful. They took cod liver oil, and we probably improved the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fats uh, in both diet groups. Yeah, so those initial 12 weeks would have had those similar changes with taking out the sugar and balancing well, the, the, the fir Yeah, the first, the first 12 weeks, remember, uh, they're doing the usual diet. The right, usual diet, yeah, sorry. Then the second 12 weeks, 
both diets were being improved. Uh, the Swank diet, and, and we've since published the paper that talked about how much both diets improved from baseline. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, the, you know, because there's a big uh, pushback from the traditional registered dietitian community that these are restrictive diets, they're not, they're harmful, uh, uh, and they may have serious micronutrient deficiencies. So what we're able to show is, you know what, both diets were remarkably more nutrient dense than the usual diet. Uh, now the Wallace diet does have less calcium uh, and the Swank diet has less calcium because we take out dairy. Um, in my, and so I, I will acknowledge that that's a concern. I appreciate uh, that concern. Our ancestors who didn't have dairy once they were weaned had denser bones than we do because they had vitamin D and they were exercised. So um, I I agree, calcium may be an issue, calcium supplements may be appropriate, Mm -hmm. but if you take calcium supplements, you have a higher rate of ectopic calcium in your heart valves and blood vessels. I'd much rather people take vitamin D, vitamin K, and lift weights and jump and jog. So Terry, what? What happened after that then? Did you get more funding for different studies? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, we uh, did get more funding. uh, And uh, this was from a a very generous uh, philanthropic gift uh, from a foundation. Uh, And we are launching a a study. We'll probably start screening uh, uh, sometime the next month for this. It's for people with relapse and remitting multiple sclerosis uh, who want to do a dietary intervention there's a ketogenic diet, uh, the modified paleo diet, which is uh, uh, the diet that we most recently studied, and dietary guidelines for America. We will get baseline assessments, uh, including an MRI. Uh, we'll bring people back in three months, uh, recheck uh, uh, some safety labs, be sure that everything's going well, and then bring them back basically in two years for repeat assessments and repeat MRIs. Uh, we'll be measuring quality of life, mood, and we'll be measuring serum neurofilaments, which is a very exciting new blood biomarker. Uh, and I, I'm really excited about that biomarker in particular because that's a, a marker of damage to uh, neurons. Uh, it it um, increases with cognitive decline, Parkinson's, aging. Uh, it's a herald for listening. Uh, uh, MS flares, relapses, and worsening disease for MS. And there was a very recent study published in uh, Germany from a uh, diet study that used a ketogenic diet, a uh, Mediterranean diet after a fasting making diet, and the usual diet. And they were able to show in the ketogenic group that the neurofilaments fell at three months and fell further at six months. Uh, and it did not change for the fast American diet group or the usual care diet group. Interesting. So at, I'm thrilled. We're going to be measuring this. Uh, we'll measure it at baseline at, at uh, 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 three months uh, and at uh, two years. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to see changes at three months. I certainly expect to see changes at uh, two years. Uh, so that's exciting. And then I'm thrilled that I have a freezer filled with uh, specimens from all of my earlier studies. So uh, I, I'm hopeful that I can find another donor to, you know, it could, uh, that would probably be about $20,000 to do the analyses oh, uh, no. for, the serum, for the serum neurofilaments uh, in my freezer. Is this, sorry, your own specimens or specimens on other people? Well, spe- specimens on uh, our studies. Okay. So every time that we've run a study, I've had the presence of mind to collect blood and freeze it at minus 80 degrees. So that it's, it's stable. We could go back and say, well, we have some new interesting biomarkers. Let's go see what happened. And as a matter of fact, we do have uh, a, a grant in front of the MS Society to investigate those biomarkers. Um, uh, we have microbiome biomarkers. Um, uh, and we want to look at uh, serum neurofilaments and a, and a number of other uh, metabolites to see how that changed over time. 
So these, these biomarkers, if you can show that they are decreasing, does that relate to inflammation as well? Because you mentioned dementia, yeah. I think. Correct. We're, so we're, we're looking at uh, uh, inflammation. We're looking at uh, uh, some of the metabolites from uh, bacteria. Because part of our theory, my, my theory and my uh, Dr. Mangalam's theory is by changing the diet, we change the microbes that live and thrive in the gut that are digesting our food and their metabolites get into our bloodstream. And many of those metabolites uh, change um, the activation status of our immune cells. And many of those metabolites get into our spinal fluid across the blood brain barrier where they change what's going on with the microglia and the astrocytes. So therefore we're, we're gonna be measuring the changes in the microbiome and the changes in the microbial metabolites and changes in the immune function. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a discovery phase then we have what's called a validation phase. Well, incredibly exciting stuff. This is exciting because if, I mean, so I'm not a, not a doctor, not a physician, but if you're, if you're looking at the microbiome and it's, it's far reaching effects in all those areas, this isn't just limited to MS, the results, oh, absolutely. right? It's all immune, autoimmune disease. Is, is that right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know, because I had such success uh, in my primary care clinic at the VA, in my traumatic brain injury clinic at the VA. Now, John, the chief of staff and the chief of medicine at the VA came to me and said, we want to pull you out of primary care, Terry. I was like, well, okay. okay. And we're going to put, have you make your own clinic because what you're doing is remarkable. So we, we, they created a clinic that we called it the Therapeutic Lifestyle Clinic. So I, I go to specialists, I go to um, uh, uh, mental health people, I go to the pain service, and I say, give me your most difficult cases, people you can't help. You're going to prescribe the drugs. I'm going to deal with diet and lifestyle, internal motivation. Uh, you know, let's see what happens. Uh, and I, we got a few people, had remarkable success. They start getting more. And so I have to keep redesigning my clinic because I, I do want people to have to wait. So we went from individual appointments to group appointments to group classes. Uh, and so we kept having to get, get into larger and larger rooms and giving uh, reports back to the chief of medicine, chief of the pain service um, uh, at first uh, twice a year, then quarterly. Then I'm giving reports back to the chief of of uh, the hospital, the chief of staff, chief nurse, uh, about the patients that we're seeing, uh, their diagnoses, how we're improving the blood pressures, uh, the blood sugars, the A1Cs, the lipids, uh, and the, you know, the national office, here's what I'm doing. And they're coming out and I'm like, well, this might be a problem. All right. But, but, you know, actually they're excited by what I'm doing. So they, take some of my ideas, incorporate that into what they call the whole health clinic. Uh, and we're helping a wide variety of disease states, mm -hmm. autoimmune diseases, metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes. And, and of course, in the VA, these are people living on food stamps, uh, 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 disabled, often not able to work uh, uh, on 15 to 30 different meds many comorbid problems. It's not just one disease state. Yeah. Can you, can you put that into context for, for my listeners? When, when I did some training with you, you mentioned a case study of one of these, one of the um, people you work with in the VA. Um, and what, what I remember from it was this guy was in the military and he was working in the, 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 the sort of the sewage pits where they burn the sewage. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he was very toxic. Do you remember that one? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, this is typical of the, of the kinds of people that I would see. Mm -hmm. uh, severe, uh, uh, terrible pain. He had had a traumatic uh, amputation uh, related to the military. He had metabolic syndrome, high blood pressure, big belly, uh, couldn't exercise uh, because of pain, couldn't sleep uh, because of pain. He had been a former alcoholic. Uh, and the bright side is... He managed to stop drinking uh, and he was part of AA. He and his wife had a very loving, supportive relationship. Uh, and 
So I said, okay. Um, he was a meat eater, so I suggested a hunter-gatherer diet. He went gluten-free, dairy-free, um, and he had to go through some withdrawals. Uh, so I warned him that yeah. that was going to be pretty uncomfortable. Swap out the sugar in the processed food with vegetables. He started having smoothies. Saw him back in six months. His pain is remarkably reduced. His blood pressure is better. His blood sugars are better. He's, you know, I, I'm doing smoothies to get all the vegetables in. I see him back in a year. His, his, his pain is remarkably, remarkably better. He's sleeping well at night. And he's a new man. Wow. And, you know, when we do, we'd have our group visits. And that's sort of, so I, I, I see new people uh, every month. We'd uh, bring them in. And then we'd follow them monthly in the group uh, for uh, six months. And so my group would have a mix of newbies and, and old timers uh, who'd been there several months. So sort of helping the newbies like, yep, you can do this. It'll change your life. Uh, and it was really uh, a joy to see. And my vets taught me that it was, my role is to inspire, give information, explain the mechanisms. Uh, offer a variety of solutions and then bring them into the group and the peer-to-peer -peer conversations were incredibly powerful with help, helping people stay yeah. motivated, uh, work through the discomfort uh, uh, that you go through as you withdraw from ha uh, harmful foods and habits mm -hmm. and replace them with helpful foods and better habits and that a peer-to-peer -peer conversation is much more powerful than me or the dietitian saying, this is how you deal. Top down, you know, yeah, peer to peer. So you, you've developed um, the Walls Behavior Change Model. <clears throat> is, that, is that sort of, was, was the genesis of that within those groups? Well, sessions? yeah, you know, the genesis of, of, of the Behavior Change Model was my time uh, in the VA. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was working with health uh, behavior folks, the registered dietitians, and then I had my own experience uh, and the vets. And so the sequence uh, starts with, you have to have an inspiring story to give people hope. And the story has to be relatable. Um, so a similar diagnosis, a similar profound level of disability uh, that, uh, so they can relate to the story. They have to have mechanisms that they can understand. So I, I developed a, repertoire of farming metaphors, mm. uh, of uh, mechanic metaphors, of teaching metaphors, um, uh, so that, uh, and of uh, plant metaphors, animal metaphors, so people could understand the concepts. And like, okay, I, I can get, I can, I can believe that how it might work. Then we work on small achievable goals, we help them identify what their goals are, small next steps. Uh, we have a cheering uh, component. We help deal with the addiction uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, and then uh, the other magic is uh, the biosensors to help them understand pain is a wonderful gift. Right. Pain is such a profound gift because it is a signal uh, of how your physiology is working. Uh, and uh, if I listen to it, I can identify what the triggers are for a worse day and what are the triggers for a better day. Okay. And, you know, you can either nurture the fact that the factors that contribute to a better day, or you nurture the factors that contribute to a worse day. Uh, and so uh, we also talked a lot about the hero's journey. And this really, really resonates uh, with my vets that we're all, we're all on a hero's journey. We're all facing a terrible, terrible enemy that has been wrecking our life and the lives of people that we care about. 
Uh, and so now I'm going to have to learn some difficult truths. And we don't know what your difficult truths are in your healing journey. But as you learn them, then you can bring these difficult truths back, re-engage with your society, your peers, to help defeat this terrible enemy of autoimmunity, of depression, uh, of uh, uh, profound pain, uh, of uh, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. And that hero's journey uh, spoke immensely. Uh, and my vets also taught me that we will do tremendous things for a cause or person that we believe in that we will give up our lives for, that we'll run into a burning building to save my son, my spouse, uh, my grandchildren, with, with, without even a moment's hesitation. Yes. So we're willing to do hard stuff. We won't do hard stuff for just anything. It has to be something that speaks to our heart. So the, the most profound class that I ever ran for, for my groups, we, we did skills classes it was cooking classes, uh, movement classes, and these uh, behavior change. The most profound class was uh, what had to do with answering that question. For what or whom would you run into a burning building to save? What is your purpose in life? Yeah. Uh, and what my vets and behaviors taught me was, you got to start there. Because we need to grow the reason to do the work. Because we're going to ask people to do hard things. We're going to ask them to give up pleasure, endure pain, and no human is biologically wired to do that willingly. Yeah. Anyone who is willing to do that would not have reproductive success. And those genes, you know, keep getting take, taken out. So we, we're always biologically wired to prefer pleasure and avoid pain. So, of course, behavior change is hard. And my, when my behaviors and my, and my vets taught me like, okay, the most important lesson that I teach is this conversation about, is there someone or something that you care so deeply about that without even a moment's hesitation, you'd run into a burning build, burning building over glass to save. And keep thinking until we, we come up with that. And if, and if there is no one, they need a mental health referral mm -hmm. because their life is so empty. If you can't find their, their why then their, and their mission, then it's hard to build the, everything else underneath that. You, can't, you, you won't be successful because no, they're not, not. you can't overcome the need for pleasure and the pain avoidance. Exactly. Yeah, that's so, so important that you mentioned that, that, and when, when I work with my clients, we start with this underlying reason for the change. Because if I define I don't hear that reason, then you know the sleep interventions, the movement interventions, the dietary interventions, they're, they're, they're difficult to do. And if the reason isn't there, people just don't do them or they give up. Correct, correct. Yeah. You know, I, and actually I'm, I'm very kind here. I acknowledge that this may not be the right time for you. It may be that your family's dealing with their own crisis because of um, uh, economic issues, because someone else in the family has um, uh, a severe health crisis, uh, they have cancer, that all of your attention is going there. So if this is not the right time, it's not the right time, come back when you are ready to take this on. Yeah. Because I have, I have a long list of, of people trying to come see me, I'll work with them until you're ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to summarize what we talked about so far, we've talked about your personal experiences, your discovery, the implementation of the, the protocol and how that's led to this research that could be you know, very profound in the medical world. 
But what what I've noticed is that you know you're working you're working with your MS and you're working with other people's MS. How do we take it back prior to that when they're healthy? How do we oh, keep them yeah, healthy? Absolutely. So we have here in the U.S. probably about 25 million people with a confirmed autoimmune diagnosis. Right. We have another 50 million that have autoantibodies, no diagnosis, and they may have pain, uh, uh, fatigue, uh, uh, brain fog, and uh, their physician says, well, labs are otherwise normal, nothing on, on the physical exam, uh, you have low level antibodies, uh, we'll just watch and wait. Or, or they have the um, uh, meta- symptoms of metabolic syndrome, or metabolic syndrome, yeah. or anxiety, or depression, or high blood pressure. So there's this, all of this is that big prodrome that we're now identifying mm-hmm. is the prodrome for autoimmunity. And the conventional world is, is using prescription meds to treat those folks, which is fine, which is appropriate. My world, I'm like, okay, yes, prescription meds may be appropriate, but we also have to improve the health of your cells. We, uh, we need to correct that physiology. We, I want to inspire people to begin to work with me on the diet and lifestyle journey. So we can correct the, the inflammation. We can reduce the oxidative stress. We can improve hormonal balance. And we can often cause those autoantibodies to regress and disappear. We can often cause those markers of of elevated inflammation, if you look at inflammatory cytokines, to regress and go back to normal. We can often cause that insulin resistance to become insulin sensitive. We can often cause that elevated blood pressure to begin to normalize. The person has to go off their blood pressure meds. Mm -hmm. And we can often cause the anxiety and the the depression troubles uh, to improve by focusing on the creation of health. We often reverse chronic disease. And the creation of health is, you're not just talking about diet now, right? So diet is part of it. Yeah. Um, But we also talk about stress reduction practices. And, you know, in the VA, I I, I was very open, like, okay, we could do mindfulness. We could do uh, uh, breathing meditations, guided meditations. We could go fish. We could just go forest bathe. We could go be out in our garden. We could have um, a a snuggling time with our pets, our dogs, our grandchildren, our spouse. We could have gratitude practices. We could go volunteer with a part of the community that speaks to us. Uh, It might be a children's theater, at the public library. So there are a variety of of ways to get that uh, stress response down. Then we talk about movement. We talk about exercise, but moderate to vigorous physical activity could be structured exercise or play. Mm -hmm. Um, So, You want to address diet and lifestyle in as many ways as you can, as comprehensively as you can. But I also am careful to do this using small achievable goals, step by step, so people have success. Uh, We caution them, you know, some people get fired up like, okay, I'll work out an hour every day. Like, no, 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 no. That's too big of a change. So what are you doing now? Let's have a small achievable goal a couple times a week and we'll, we'll build on that. Okay. And when, with that in mind, uh, we're probably coming to the end of our time together. Could you talk a little bit about what you do? And in particular, I know that you do um, the saunas and the cold baths. So you actually use stress or a physical yeah. stress on your body to help you get healthy. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? So um, I I like to uh, get up in the morning. Uh, I have a variety of meditation practices, mindfulness strategies I'll do. So that's the first thing uh, I'll do. Then I will get up and I have uh, some strength training program. Uh, I have a vibration plate uh, that I might do or or I may swim. So it's one of those three things that I will do. 
Then I will go into my sauna uh, and I have a near infrared sauna uh, 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 that I use. Uh, so I have red light uh, in heat and I indulge in reading for pleasure. And I'm reading a thriller book right now by, um, uh, uh, so I'm very excited about that. And I alternate between uh, uh, fiction and nonfiction. Uh, so then I get out of uh, the sauna and I'll go do a cold shower for five minutes. Uh, and the other thing that I like doing is in the evening is doing an ice bath uh, for 20 minutes before going to bed. So if I do my ice bath, um, that will, you know, cools my core temperature. Uh, and it, whenever I do that, it's the fastest I fall asleep, the deepest sleep that I have, the highest quality sleep. Wow. So, have, have you converted the, the freezer? Uh, no, I've seen people uh, do that. I, um, I've done that. I've done that. It works a treat. It, um, it, the other thing that I've done is, so I have an endless pool and I, I don't heat it. Right. And so that gets, you know, quite, you know, so it, it's winter now. It's going to get colder and colder and colder. Um, however, my wife and daughter all, also swim. And so they said, you know, honey, We'd like it a little bit warmer. Could you, yeah. would, could, would you let us turn the heat, heat on a little bit? So we're, we're having some negotiations as to uh, how warm the pool is going to be now. You're not going to just show them the research papers and say, look, this is good for you. Jump in. Well, um, I have tried, but so far, you know, they keep saying, no, we, you know, we would like it a little bit warmer. So yeah, that's understandable. Like, oh, okay. So you're doing all this and you're, you're still a practicing physician. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You're, Probably writing another book. Are well, you? you know, we're having the debate of uh, do I write the book on the uh, Walls Behavior Change Model? So right. uh, I'm considering that. Um, so there's plenty of content. We could write the book. The next question is, uh, I have to be sure I have it in me to do all the work it takes to sell the book after it's published. Yes. So that's yeah. a conversation I have with my spouse and my team to be sure that we're all on the same page. Wow. And so, and you're, so you're running a team for all the, the seminars and the, the courses you're running yeah. and you're doing the research. So how do you find the time to do all this? Well, um, you have to have a good team of people. So I have a good team to run the seminar uh, and to help educate there. Um, then I have a, a good team to run the research. Uh, and now I, I'm, I'm, I've got myself uh, really excited about the next grant we're putting in uh, to investigate how to safely stop disease modifying drug treatments because uh, I, I think that's such a, a an important question yes uh, and what what happens is it, it's so intoxicating invigorating changing the world doing the work right. that speaks to your heart your mission there it is uh, and then my spouse will say and Zeb will say You know, so my spouse will say, honey, you've scheduled too many eight o'clock meetings. You got to stop that. And my daughter said like last night, mom, you should be going to bed. Right. Teddy is wondering why you aren't in bed. So, so my family sort of keeps an eye on me. And then yeah. the other thing that keeps an eye on me is my face pain. Right. So if I, if my self-care drops, my face pain turns on. So, you know, I, I can sort of, and I will do this because I love what I do. You know, I love doing the research. I love the seminar. I, I, I have this uh, moral work that I'm doing that I'm so passionate about. I'll push myself too hard. Absolutely. I've do done you, that all my life. And that's probably, probably part of the reason you got the MS. And, and that's why I got ill. And, yeah. you know, so I'm so blessed that I've now figured out like, Oh, my face pain turned on. Yep, I have done too many eight o'clock meetings. I, you know, I, I gotta stop this. Yeah. And so, how can people find out more more about you and and participate in your world? Yeah, yeah. So terrywalls.com, T-E-R-R-Y Walls, W-A-H-L-S dot com. Uh, go add forward slash diet, so you can uh, download the one page uh, diet sheet, uh, and then uh, look. Uh, sign up for our newsletter because we'll have uh, articles, research updates. See, um, uh, you, you get lots of great information. 
And you get to hear when we do, because we periodically do free five-day challenges uh, that give people um, more lessons and more support to start this very right. important uh, behavior change that will change your the way you think about disease and health and will change your uh, healing journey. And that, but you also go beyond the five-day free, free um, uh, things. You, you have a seminar as well. Yep. So we, we have the seminar and Ed, you're speaking. I'm uh, very excited that you're going to be speaking at that. The seminar uh, goes into uh, the latest research. Um, I, I give highlights uh, to some of the research uh, uh, and scientific meetings that I've gone to all year long. Uh, and we have speakers that address uh, components of diet, self-care and healing. And so we've got uh, four seminars this coming year. We have one on brain health basics, one on mycotox mycotoxins and hormone balance, uh, one on building resilience, uh, emotional mm -hmm. and cellular resilience. Uh, that's the one that you're speaking on, Ed. And then one on healthy aging. As you can tell, I'm beginning to get some gray hair. Uh, Ed has just a touch of uh, dignified <laughs> gray. So Ed and I are both really paying attention to how we stay healthy and age as well as we can, because I want to be playing with uh, children. Uh, I want to be playing with uh, young people. I want to be doing research. I want to be changing the world when I'm 100, when I'm 120. I plan, like my dad said, there's good work to do. I'm going to work uh, my whole life. I think there's good work to do. I want to work my whole life, but I also want to play my exactly. whole life. You got to have that balance. Yeah. Okay, Terry. Well, thank you very much for giving your time to us today and keep up the amazing work that you're doing in the world. Thank you. I hope you found that as fascinating as I did. But before you go, I really want you to subscribe to this podcast. Leave a comment and I'll get back to you or a like, because the more subscribers I get, the more podcasts I can do. So thank you very much in advance and I'll see you in the next one.